It's another beautiful Sunday afternoon. This is Robin Minds. Welcome. My name is Ebuka Obi Uchendu. Thanks a lot for joining us. Um, we're here to start the show talking about something that Nigerians are really burdened about but doesn't seem to get a lot of talk time. We're talking housing and uh, its many issues and problems uh, that we face as citizens. Um, I'm going to be joined by two people who know a lot better than I do how we are where we are and hopefully what we should be thinking about going forward. I'm joined now by um, Akinyo Patola, who's an estate surveyor and valuer, and uh, Koko Aneto Soke, who's a new media consultant. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Let me start with you, Aki. Um, Aki, we've had so many policies. Uh, I think that's one thing Nigeria is great at, putting out policies. A lot of them great a lot of the times, and housing isn't left out in that. But we don't seem to see the end result of this. Um, I think it was in 2018 we did hear government talk about 300,000 new uh, low-income uh, housing units for Nigerians. I don't know what the situation of that is now. Why does it seem like government uh, doesn't seem very intentional with executing or at least providing uh, public housing for Nigerians? Thank you very much. So the reality is this. It's, um, it's a major and global challenge. Um, it's not only in um, Nigeria that you have uh, housing shortages. I think from the last count, depending on which statistics you, you look at, some people would claim 17 million, some would claim 20 million. So with those challenges, there are huge uh, opportunities. I was just thinking to myself the other day while I was reading um, a book that look, um, housing, whether affordable or not, is not just the role of government. There are individuals, the communities, the private sector also have to come to play. So it's huge. Uh, government is playing their part. Private individuals also have to play their part. But uh, everybody needs to come together to be able to solve the huge deficit that we currently have in the country. I want to talk about pricing now. <laughs> and I think it's something a lot of Nigerians are very interested in, especially... Uh, this is one of those places where nothing ever comes down when it goes up. And in the last two years, at least, it looks like things have gotten even crazier. At a time when the rest of the world seems to be, you know, taking a dip, especially with what uh, the lockdown and COVID did to people. We saw a lot of countries where even rent was put on hold. Uh, housing uh, pricing was, you know, reduced to a certain levels so that people could um, at least be able to leave. We haven't seen that here in Nigeria. Um, why does housing pricing, or the pricing of houses in Nigeria, why, does, why do market forces never seem to affect it? So, if I need to be brutally honest, one of the factors will be corruption. You see it in other climates, uh, especially in Europe, um, places in Asia, um, where you don't use ill-gotten funds and this is me being uh, direct, we don't use ill-gotten funds to develop housing stock. You would notice that the real estate mirrors the economy. So as the economy is dipping, as, the, as you're reaching a recession, depending on which economic cycle you're in, it will reflect on the housing um, rates. And you will see investors, you see private individuals getting concerned. Nobody wants to have a void. Nobody wants to have vacancies. So gradually, the rental prices or sales prices begin to dip gradually. But in a lot of these um, countries where corruption is high, people don't care. The property is there. They tell you that, hey, look, uh, the property is not drinking uh, water. It's not disturbing anybody. They leave it. They target really at the high end of the market the high rent, and they're not bothered about it uh, dipping anyway because they're not bothered. The funds are, are not, um, they didn't work hard for those funds any which way. So uh, I would like to answer it um, in that way. Last year, yes, we saw um, the pandemic. In some places, I, would, I, I can categorically say that, yes, rents did drop in some parts of um, Lagos where I can speak confidently. Um, in some other parts, too, it didn't drop, but that could be easily uh, attributed to demand. Where demand is high, uh, definitely just like the law of um, demand and supply, where demand is high, uh, the rents um, would be high, especially where supply doesn't match um, the demand. Okay, let me come to you now, Coco. Um, 
You've recently moved from Lagos to Abuja. Um, what was your experience like, especially considering the two cities? These are the two major urban cities in Nigeria. Maybe putting it in context, comparing both, as well as you know, moving there. How uh, was it for you? Essentially moved back to my family house in Abuja because I couldn't get a place to rent in Lagos and I had overstayed my rent by a month. And like you said, it was at the height of the pandemic and I had been trying to find a place to stay. I was going to use one of those um, platforms that let you pay monthly because for me as a person, the most difficult thing about house hunting in Lagos is I'm a freelancer. And as much as I try to save, I have other obligations family-wise and I never have that money in bulk. You're trying to rent a place that's comfortable in a decent area and you're seeing a certain amount of rent, like 1 million upwards. And it's a bit it was a bit difficult for me to have that amount of money to pay in bulk. And so I would always look for a situation where I could pay on a monthly basis. So I was trying to use one of those um, platforms that lets you pay monthly, which was easier for me. But unfortunately, the place I wanted to get was taken by someone else before I could pay for it. And then I was looking at other options and I remember seeing a place a week before that was a certain price. And at the time when I was ready to go and see the place and pay for it, the price had gone up almost double. So I was just like, okay, I'm moving back home. This seems to be the story of a lot of Nigerians, especially young Nigerians, you know, moving out and moving back home because they can keep up with this payment of rent. So Coco, still with you. Um, when you have these conversations with agents or landlords, uh, there's even a law, at least in Lagos, about not collecting two years' worth of rent, for example. There are certain parts of Lagos where you can pay monthly. So that law essentially exists wherever the law is written. It's definitely not a reality. I can't remember a single place that I tried to rent where I wasn't asked to pay at least a year and a half in advance. And a year and a half is with begging, like, please, this is what I have. Let me pay this. Akin, this looks like something I need to come back to you with now, because like she said, a lot of places around the world, it's, it's what happens. You pay monthly. Um, in Nigeria, we've seen, I think it was uh, the Lagos State Governor back in the day, Tunde Fashola, who had put out this policy, you know, about reviewing uh, the frequency of rent collection or the tenor, whatever it is. Um, why is that not a thing here? And why is enforcing so hard? Okay, good. So one reason is because of the huge capital outlay to develop properties. 80%, um, some will even say 90% of um, construction cost materials are imported. We know what the exchange rate is saying at the moment. It is, it is staggering. So people want to, most investors, developers, property owners want to recoup as fast as possible, getting um, loans, getting facilities to, to build um, in this part of the world is tough with the double digit interest rates. So in reality, I don't see it happening anytime soon. Um, but, and I put this caveat, a lot of things are changing. And um, I was trying to share with um, Coco that, look, these days, people have one-on-one -on -one conversations with agents, brokers, and even landlords. I say, hey, look, I've seen your property. I like it. I've gotten the offer letter. I know you're asking for one year rent, so I don't have it. I just honestly don't have it. Can I pay you quarterly in advance? Can I pay you half yearly? We've seen those conversations, especially within the last two, three years. It is quite popular now. Uh -huh, but it comes on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You've seen landlords being more realistic with their own expectations. Yeah. You've mentioned something I'm, I'm very interested in, which is you know, the construction pricing. Um, a place like the United States, which is literally the number one country in the world, there's a lot less emphasis on cement, for example, and uh, you get a lot of prefabrication uh, that goes on. I don't know if that's cheaper, but it does seem like it is. Um, what's, why are we so reliant on concrete, for example, if you're saying that that's probably why housing is priced the way it is? Is there a climate issue with the way our temperature here is? Why we can't use all the material to build that's probably cheaper? I wouldn't say it's a climate issue. Um, it is getting more and more um, 
prevalent. I've seen uh, a lot of construction companies coming from um, India, even from the United States with this new um, housing concepts. Eventually, yes, in terms of cost, it still tends to be quite uh, expensive uh, because of the value chain. That's one. Two, we also have this uh, building with compressed earth, which is also uh, popular, but it is it's simply fad. It's just fashion. Uh, most people, they, are not, they don't want to accept it, even when they know that, look, you can achieve your home ownership dream at a fraction of the cost. And the, we need to hear feedback like, ah, I don't want to build with mud or with earth or with container type um, structures. Nah, what will my friends say? What will people say? That's just it. Because we've seen models. They are fantastic. In fact, there are a couple of even um, hotels and um, high rise buildings that use this concept and they're amazing. And at the end of the day, when they are finished, wow, you won't be able to tell the difference. But yes, cost is a major, it's still a major issue. Coco, um, a lot of young people have been accused uh, of, you know, complaining about the wrong things because we want to live in certain areas. So you want to live in Lagos, but you want to live in a certain area just for whatever reason. Um, like I've said a lot, a lot of places around the world, people don't necessarily live in the cities. You live in suburbs or you have a commute to work and go back home because you're trying to get better or cheaper housing. Um, in places like Abuja, there's a lot of estates away from the city, uh, but most people don't want to live in those places because they don't want to drive for 30 minutes to an hour to get to work and come back as is the norm everywhere else in the world. Do you think that's a, a part of the problem where there's housing, but people want to live in certain areas and you know, complain about the wrong things? Um, so um, if that's OK, I'm going to speak as someone who has lived in Lagos in both a suburb kind of area and in the main city, and then in Abuja as well, mostly from my experience, from hearing from other people. So in Lagos, I've lived at Ian Paja, not Ian Paja exactly, but like Mangoro, which is pretty close at Tuleki. So it's not a situation, I don't think it's a situation of people not wanting to live outside the city. It's the fact that, like I said, you're trying to get a place to live at the end of the day. You want something that is livable, right? And cost like affordable for you as a person. Regardless of your commute, for some people, yes, they do not want to make that sacrifice, which is understandable in my own opinion, especially in a city like Lagos, where I would live in Mangoro, I would have to come out of my house at 4 a.m. or 4.30 a.m. every day to get a bus. I don't drive. I would have to get a bus to Yaba or to Oshodi because if by five o'clock that bus was 300 naira. If I come out at seven, that bus is 600 naira. I knew what times the bus would leave from Lekki, from Obalende, from um, even VI to Iyanipaja to get me home. I knew the last times the bus would stop, most time 8 p.m., 9 p.m., just to get the cheapest fare home, right? And those are sacrifices a lot of people make. I wasn't the only one living where I was living. I knew a lot of people either making the commute from Aja to Yaba, and it's mostly because of the same thing. Where I was living in Mangoro, it was affordable for me at that time. That was what I could afford. And out of all the options, it was the most livable. And honestly, it was nothing to write home about. It was four steps from one wall to the other where I was living. It was a room that was four steps from one wall to the other, and I, I paid almost 250000 for that space. In Abuja, it's not even an issue. Commuting in Abuja, I don't really think there's much of a commute in the SCT unless you live in like Kebi or like Suleja. So those are people coming from outside Abuja. I don't know of anyone in particular who does that because they can't find a place in Abuja to stay. Um, housing in Abuja, while it does seem more expensive, in my opinion, it's a lot easier to be honest, because like you said, there are lots of estates in the non-city center areas like Katampe, 
um, Grandpa, even um, what's that area called? There are lots of <laughs> estates, and they are really good. Like I've been to some of those houses, and I'm like, fam, if I was ready to move out of my family house, I would move there, right? And they're pretty affordable. You can get like a two bedroom for like two point five, three million. You can even get cheaper if you're willing to look. I know someone who just got a three bedroom around Katampe for like two million. And that he even bargained and was like, oh, so, you know, I'll pay this now. I think they wanted him to pay like three million, but he was like, I'm still going to refurbish. I'm going to paint, bring in furniture. So they were able to give it to him at two million minus all the agents fees and all that. So it's relatively easier to find housing here. Moving from even Kubwa to Abuja, to like my time out somewhere, it's like 30, 45 minutes. And as someone who has lived in Lagos, that's not much of a commute. And I find that in Abuja, people are a lot more willing to like share their space. In Lagos, I would often try to find someone who I could be like, can I rent a room in your apartment and pay you monthly? And not a lot of people are willing to do that. In Abuja, more people are willing to do that. They are friends. A lot of people just come together and rent a place together. Or people are like, oh, I'm looking for someone to share. Do you know anyone who wants to share? And moving together because it's a lot easier to split the rent. And I think maybe just in general, people are more trusting, I guess, is a way to look at it. But I don't think accusing people of wanting to live in the city is a very viable excuse for the ridiculous situation of finding a house. To take it uh, on a wider context and as quickly as you can, just answer this, Coco still with you. Um, do you think this is a Lagos, Abuja, maybe Port Harcourt problem? And there's probably affordable housing in a lot more of the other 34 states we have in this country. Are we just trying to concentrate too much on these cities? Um, with the problems? I don't know what housing in other cities is like, but I will agree that a lot of people are focusing on living in Abuja, Lagos, Port Harcourt, and other major cities. I don't know what the housing situation in other cities is like. Okay, let me close this out with you, Akin, very quickly now. Very, very, very fascinated for years now by Singapore. Um, I think they have something around 90% of their citizens who own their homes. It's probably, I think, the highest in the world. Um, I've been there, I've seen public housing there, stories and stories and stories of, you know, apartments when you drive around the, the country. Um, obviously, from a deliberate policy from government, I think it started around the 60s or 70s to make sure that Singaporeans could own their homes, whether it's a one or two or three bed. And it has worked out for them. Um, we have a state, for example, like Lagos, which is the smallest state in this country, but you can hardly find any high-rise buildings to start with. You know? So are we not doing the wrong things, and what can we learn from a country like Singapore? So I think we can learn a whole lot. We can learn a whole lot. But I would, um, my take would be a little bit different. Yes, we can pick um, a couple of things from um, Singapore and build vertically, but... You know, um, it's one thing to own a property, it's another thing to maintain it. So uh, maintenance is a huge issue um, in Nigeria. Yes, we're getting better with the prevalence of property uh, managers and, um, and facility managers, but it's huge. Um, and it will be another challenge. So it's, you're, you're creating one, uh, you're solving one problem to create um, to create another. Um, let me also mention that, yes, home ownership in um, Nigeria, I was looking at some statistics. Um, we have less than 25, less than 25%. If you, we have less than uh, 500,000 mortgages too, um, nationwide, which is abysmally low. Even a country like Accra, Ghana, they, they are closer to, to or nearing 50%. So there's a whole lot. But I think we are also making gradual steps. The challenges are huge. With challenges come um, opportunities. Um, about two, three years ago, I think the current uh, CBN governor also brought out some policies. They were giving incentives to banks, commercial banks, to give out uh, mortgages so that um, we can increase home ownership um, rates in Nigeria. I did banking for about 10, 11 years. 
first-hand information from a lot of my friends, colleagues who are still in banking. They use that opportunity to get their own homes. Even some of my friends, too, that are not in banking, based on those CBN policies, too, um, they were able to put funds together and gradually started uh, the process of, um, of home ownership. It's, it's, it's tough. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't say it's something that um, these rates will grow overnight, but gradually, gradually, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure we'll get there. Well, thank you very much, Akin. Thank you very much, Coco. Uh, looking forward to better days ahead. I don't know how soon those will be, but um, Coco, all the best. Hopefully you get some better housing in the near future. <laughs> I'm very okay at home for now. Okay, as long as you're happy. Thank you very much. We're going to take a break now and come back. Please don't go away. Welcome back to the show now. We're going to be talking entertainment and I'm joined now by a guest who uh, took Nigerian television by storm over the past decade plus and has continued to shine on her own terms, interestingly. So we're going to be finding out um, how she does it, uh, why she does it. Uh, we see her when she wants us to see her and um, we're glad to see her today. Dambilola Digbite, thanks for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm, I'm very well, thank you. <coughs> so good to see you. Really good to see you. Yeah, same here. What's what's happening? You like to disappear from us. Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Explain like to us. It's the only thing that will give me stress. But um, I usually like to... I'm a bit of a hermit, you know. I just like to spend time on my own, you know, just shut my doors and, you know, figure myself out, figure my life out. When I'm ready, then I'll come out, you know. So, yeah, that's what I just do. So a lot of people who are on the outside might find that very confusing because they see, you know, entertainment or celebrities as people who should be out there constantly, you know, either doing their work or at least putting stuff out yeah. just so that, you know, you are, quote unquote, still relevant, you know, but you yeah. don't seem to care much for that. Um, doesn't it ever worry you uh, with the perception that, oh, if she's not being seen, it means she's not doing anything? Funny enough, I was having a conversation with a friend yesterday. I had dinner with a friend and we were talking about this. And I was saying to myself, you know, I never really started. I didn't really know I was. I wanted the fortune eh, without the fame. I don't know how I was planning to get that. <laughs> but <laughs> from the beginning, my idea was I want money. I wasn't really thinking I wanted to be famous, you know. So it's a bit of a conflict for me. Honestly, I struggle with it because... You know, that's just who I am. I'm not really someone who's out there all the time. I don't like to be overseen or overheard. I'm, I don't like to be in people's faces. And we all know that, like you said, celebrity life is important. You have to be in people's faces like every second of every day as much as you can. So honestly, it's a bit of a conflict for me. I try my best, but at the same time, I try to keep a healthy balance where I don't feel like I'm losing myself. You know, I, I don't know who I am anymore. And um, I'm trying not to look at it from the aspect of, oh, you have to impress people. You have to give people what they want all the time. So I'm not feeling constant pressure of, oh, I have to be this person that everybody expects me to be. So I try to just maintain a healthy balance as much as I can, you know, and it's been working for me. It works for me. Looks like it is. But you're talking about not being in people's faces every second. And unfortunately for you, but fortunately for us, you started off on a show where you were on our faces every day, you know, <laughs> where a lot of us yeah. got introduced to you as Thelma Duke uh, on Tinsel. We saw you every day of the week and, you know, we got too used to that. So let's go back to that, you know, was acting deliberate for you or did you get on tinsel uh, because you wanted to act? Did something happen by chance? Was this always a dream you had? No, of course, it was always a dream. I, I always wanted to be an actor. I still want to be an actor. You know, I just, I love the expressions, you know, the freedom to express ourselves, to be different people on screen. So for Tinsel, it was deliberate, you know, at the time chasing auditions, I was, you know, I wanted, you know, acting to be my career. So I was activating, but Tinsel still came as a surprise though, because it was bigger than I expected it would be. 
you know, I thought, oh, you know how we think as human beings, you're like, oh, when you're starting humble beginnings, small beginnings, you know. So I was expecting, okay, I would start as one waka pass or, you know, some few cameo appearances before somebody notices me. Okay, I may not be paid from the beginning. I may have to do free gigs, but Chinsu was like, bam, it was huge. And it was my first gig. So yeah, it, it's always what I wanted to do. It wasn't a fluke. It happened, you know. People always complain about, you know, the transition from TV to, to maybe the big screen. Um, most times you get boxed into that TV star, you know, persona and people don't necessarily see you on the big screen. Was it a hard thing to, you, to do for you to sort of, you know, start making that switch to do film? Did you feel boxed in for a while? Was that why you left? Um, so I did feel like that at the beginning because I noticed that many of the roles I was being casted for were um, intimate roles. So I think because of the kind of relationship that I, I mean, I had on Tinsel with my co-cast as in Soji and Kwame, it was like, you know, they were my love interests. So I was getting a lot of, you, you have to be intimate in all your roles, you know? And I think that that kind of reduces your, your, how do I put it? Your, um, it just minimizes your potential, you know, when you're just being boxed in the same place, or especially as an actor. I'm an actor in the first place, which means I'm a creative, which means I like to express myself. So I want to be the poor girl on the streets. I want to be the person selling plantain. I want to, you know, experience different <laughs> roles. But they'll tell you, you cannot sell plantain. Your lights, they look at you, how can you know? So yeah, it was a bit of an issue. It still is, honestly. I think it still is. Um, but yeah, I haven't left, by the way. It's not like I've left the industry. I'm just very choosy very picky i think that's what it is all right so um i mean nollywood is going through a very interesting time uh we have a lot of these streaming platforms coming in now and there's a lot of global eyeballs on the industry so it's a very good time to be an actor i want to believe in nigeria yeah. uh, but you were talking about being choosy so how do you draw the line between you know being you know available so that the world you know sees this talent that you have enough on all of these platforms that are available now while also being choosy and not losing out completely. I see what you mean. Um, I think what we are beginning to realize as celebrities in general, not just actors, is that it's important to build your own stage. So you sort of have to take, you know, and even with the producers, you know, who are pushing limits and telling different kinds of stories from what we're used to. Everyone is sort of building their own path to some extent, which I think is the future of things. If, um, if you decide that, okay, the producers are not really telling me, are not really calling me for the kinds of scripts that I want, or, you know, I'm not doing, then you might have to sit down and think about writing your own movies or sit down and think about writing your own short films or whatever it is that or think think about being you know just writing your own skits or whatever but that's what a lot of people are doing now even with the comedians they're not sitting down and waiting for ay or basketball to call them anymore they're creating their own short skits and putting them on social media so these are things that i definitely have in mind and things that i'm working on at the same time you know, but I think it's time for everyone to control their own narrative. Which you are. You've talked about a lot. So I might be wrong, but I feel like a lot of these decisions you've made, you know, with regards to, you know, being more deliberate with what you do and how much time you work came with becoming a mother. How much is becoming a mother affects, you know, the way you started seeing uh, your work as an actor? Well, I feel like um, to a large extent it did. But at the same time, I think it's really just who I am. You know, I've never really been the type to be everywhere, to be seen doing everything and to be doing everything because that's what's trending, because that's what everybody wants you to see. I've never really been the noisy type. But definitely being a mother has added to it because now I know that 
their two little pair of eyes constantly watching me. And they're not going to be little forever. They're going to be big one day and they're going to be seeing what mommy's been doing, you know? And I think definitely there's a huge responsibility that comes being a single, well, being a mother and being a single mother, honestly, because now you are the mommy and the daddy, you know, but it depends on you. You can, some people are mothers and they're still rocking their lives. Like it depends on you really. And just what you what your values are, you know, what you believe in. So for me, yes, I think motherhood added to it a lot, but I also don't, I don't think that I would have been any different, even if I wasn't a mother, if that makes any sense, you know. So speaking of motherhood now, I mean, you were in a relationship that was uh, public uh, to an extent because of the kind of person you were in a relationship with. He was a fellow actor on the show that you were on. So a lot of people were sort of, you know, a part of that story. Um, I don't want to talk about social media now and how it sort of, you know, affects, you know, how you live as an actor. Um, how do you handle sort of, you know, people's opinions, not on your work now, but on personal life? Because social media is very intrusive these days. And there are people who will tell you, well, you need to give a little because uh, it also helps you sort of stay uh, connected to the fans or whatever it is. How do you handle social media opinions, criticism? or whatever it is of your personal life? Do you log off or do you respond? I mean, we saw Jim Ike <laughs> recently uh, go, go face to face with someone I, who he felt that. called him out, you know? So is that something you could do, for example? <laughs> I think I've learned how to shut off. I've learned how to build a wall around myself. You know, I've my experiences and just what I've been through has sort of, it's giving me a new level of strength, you know, I just, I won't say I'm completely numb because at the end of the day, you know, the truth is other people's opinions about you matter as well, to an extent, depending on how much you want it to matter. So I think I've just learned to not take anything too personal, even if I come up, I scroll through my posts or whatever, and I see any comments, if you see anything I don't like, I block you. Nobody's above blocking. I just delete it and I block it. So really, you know, it, it, I've just learned how to be stronger. I think that's what it is. But do you ever really, you know, stay away completely from social media? Does it ever not get to you? Um, isn't it also true that no matter how much you want to uh, shut off, you still know that, you know, you need to present yourself a certain way, whether you like it or not. I think it was sometime in May, you put out a post about um, how hard the fitness journey has been for you and something about how it's hard now for you to keep sucking below or something like that. You know, that's obviously talk about how your image uh, is uh, to the public. So that still matters, doesn't it? Definitely. Which is why I said that to a large extent, people's opinions about you matter. So that's why, you know, you you just have to draw a line and know, okay, at the end of the day, social media is not a person. Social media is a million and one voices from all over the world who have different experiences, different opinions. Are you really going to allow those people judge who you are? You know, so I think there has to be, you have to be able to strike a meaningful balance between maintaining who you are and maintaining people's opinions of you. You cannot lean more to one side than you would to the other. And I think that's where the real um, challenge is as a public figure, because you're constantly in people's eyes and you're thinking, oh, I have to maintain this. And at the same time, I have to do me. And that's why a lot of us are depressed and we're dealing with anxiety and we're living larger than our capacity. You know, so I think being able to find that balance and, you know, I call it a healthy balance, just where you feel like, you know, you're right in the center of it. It's OK. Everything else, you know, is it gravitates around you as a person, you're self-aware of who you are. Then, I mean, whatever comes, you figure it out. You know, that's just how I live. Let's go to... Um still talking about personal life now and social media. I mean, September, for a lot of people, this year has been quite a month. 
with celebrities and their personal lives on social media. You know, a lot has happened. I mean, people have been saying this September needs to end because it looks like it's really going around before it reaches somebody else's turn, you know. What are your thoughts on, you know, intentionally or not, putting, you know, your personal life out there? Generally, because there are people who, I mean, there are some things that happened this month where we know that, okay, people said they were pushed and couldn't take it anymore, which is why they just needed to vent. Is social media a good place to vent, you think? You know, how do you handle situations where you feel like there's nobody else to speak with and maybe you need to just put things out there? Do you think that's a good call? I feel like when somebody goes that far, it's a cry for help. It's a desperate cry for help. They must have tried other avenues and they just need help. And a lot of times when we're just reaching for anything, we're not really thinking, you know, we're not, that's not the time to start processing. We just need help. So as much as I don't think it's, social media is not the law. It's not, there's no judge there who's going to, you know, at the end of the day, but I see it as it's a mental, it's a breakdown. And so, you know, as much as we can, we just, although they don't really care, you know, they don't care. They don't <laughs> really care. <laughs> We're just giving them G's, you know. I, this is what I think. I feel like, except you, this is a situation, a situation where you have been wrongly accused of something. For instance, you are a brand, you're a celebrity. You are influencing brands. You know, you have a reputation to maintain so if somebody wrongly accuses you to the public you have to speak out to set the record straight you have to protect yourself in that situation I'm 100% for it because you can't talk bad and then I have to tell the world my side of the story but when it's things that happen inside the house that's you don't like they don't really care you know it's just content you're just and well you're just entertaining them. So I feel like as much as we can, let's just try to avoid it. You know, God be with everybody. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's easy to sit and give advice, but you're not the one in it. So you don't know. They're breaking down, you know? So as much as we can, we just have to be understanding. Very well said there. Now, before we go, I mean, you've been away on your terms. You come back when you want to. Before 30 was great, by the way. Um, <laughs> what are we looking forward to with Damilola in the coming months, if anything? Well, I am working on a few projects. Um, I've sat down. I've gone inside of my hole that I go to, you know. <laughs> I, <laughs> I have um, hibernated enough. I have, you know re strategize and now I'm working on a few projects that I'm sure in the next couple of months we'll hear about. Um, yeah, I mean, fingers crossed, everything goes amazingly well. But yeah, let's just say in a few months I'll be adding a few more titles to, you know, my recent actor, TV personality, all of that. So we're working hard behind the scenes, and we are we are not hiding. No, we are just. <laughs> <laughs> we're just re-strategizing pretty much so yeah you're one of those who's done you know you've done tv you've done film you've done stage i believe so what is uh, this project you're talking about which of them record album i want to start singing now <laughs> <laughs> i want to start singing now you just see that me maybe you can to find me <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I'm not going into music, guys. No. But soon, soon. If you know now, we can't let the cat out of the bag just yet. But you okay, want no problems. <laughs> no problems. Good luck with everything. Looking forward to you, you know, being back on, on our TV screens and our, on, our, on the big screen as well. Welcome back to the show. Now, on the 8th of September, it was World Literacy Day. And um, with Nigeria in the conversation, it's always a very um, sober moment for us to talk about because um, literacy levels here, and we talk about out-of-school children and all of that, it's usually a very hard conversation to have. And a lot of people are not sure if we're making any progress at all. But I'm joined here now by Dr. Francis Adishino from Ridland, Nigeria. 
Redland NG. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing, sir? I'm great, and I'm excited to be here. Thanks a lot for joining us. Um, take us through um, where Nigeria is at the moment with uh, the World Literacy Day in context. Um, there are so many conflicting statistics, but I think 62%, uh, I think, is what it is for adult literacy in the country. Is that something we should be celebrating? Not really. Um, if you look at the clear statistics um, from the UN, we have over 10 million to 13.5 million children and youths that are out of school. And 90% to 80% to 90% are in the north. So it's something we shouldn't celebrate really. When, yeah. when it comes to government, like you, you, you earlier said that um, in Nigeria, a family on its own will provide everything. Let's see government, let's put government aside and say they've done their best. But what, what can we do to help ourselves? I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to say that it is. Let me explain why. Because if you if you keep putting government into the equation of change in Nigeria, we won't go far. Let's, let's maximize what they've already done and see it as a stepping stone to what we ourselves can achieve, especially for, for, for allies, for, for people like us that have seen the benefit of education. So how can we give back? How can we help our next neighbor? There are three levels of transformation when it comes to education, the personal and family, the community, then the society at large. Or let's put it this way, personal, family, the school, private or public, then the community. How can we start that transformation and help the government from where they, from the best that they've done? No matter how you classify it, either they've done well or they've not done anything at all. What can you do? How can you help? the next neighbor, the next child. Okay, before we go into um, what it is uh, you're talking about with regards to what we as individuals can do, I mean, this government was very heavy on um, f uh, providing food for school children and using that to attract uh, children back to school, at least make parents take their children to school. Uh, do you think that's a good way for one to, you know, make people understand that, okay, you can get a meal here, but while you're doing that, at least you get some education. Do you think that's a, a good way to start? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good way to start. One of the first things to put in place when you're trying to establish an education system that works. And I, I think before we go further, we need to redefine what education means. It shouldn't be limited to within the walls of, the, of, of classrooms. Good, they've done, they've done their bit, but the first thing to put in place is motivation. How can you motivate them to even assess what is available, to even assess the free education? So what are those things we need to put in place? And the motivation should also come from two sides. One, from those that are, from those, the teachers, then to the parents, that will need to bring their, their children to school, sometimes at a cost. So what are the motivation system that needs to be put in place? Meal is part of it. Like one of those things we do, we, we, we feed, we, we make them know that there'll be food, there'll be snacks. So we, we are, apart from what they've done, what are those things that we need to do? Sometimes we can even pay transportation, but the beauty now is how can we take it to their home? Because one of those things motivation will do, how convenient is, is it? What system of convenience is in place to make them move from where they are to where education is, 
is 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 taking place. Okay, now so you're talking about you know what we as individuals can do, and it's uh, I, I get your points on that, you know, but we also have a huge number of people who are living in poverty. So there's only so much weight yeah. that um, what you said the el the elites can carry. Uh, you know, uh, how much they can do, especially considering the fact that, like you said, a huge number of uh, out-of-school children are in a certain part of the country. We also had, you know, COVID-19, which disrupted education seriously. We're also living in a very digital age where the way children learn is completely different now from what it was, say, five, six years ago. Um, we're playing catch-up on so many fronts. Uh, so give us maybe on a bit of a broader sense what we as Nigerians can do to help change this? Okay, at Ridland, one thing we discover is if you can make data available, if you can make devices available, and if you can make power available, you can take education to their, or learning to their doorsteps. What are we doing? We are creating community centers. It's nothing big. You don't have to build structures. You only need spaces. Then we now buy flat screens, laptops, and data. Then transmit what the instructor or the teacher needs to pass in form of um, learning. You understand? Like we do coding, we take it to the community. We take it to rural environment where they can't even afford data, where they can't afford devices. Then make them assess this learning for free. So if Nigerians can support su such moves, we have, we have this special reading program, Read Aloud. Read Aloud is one of those things, tools for learning that opens the minds of children and make them glued to learning. You understand? So we invite, we we invite celebrities like you to come and read to them. So we take greatness to them. So it's not enough to let them know that in, um, education is important. You need to show them. So we also did a research and realized that children love what they see those they love doing. So when we bring them on those platforms and transmit it to their centers in that rural place where low income children live, you understand? They also want to become like the reader. So as we do that, we also branch into other master classes where we also relate and connect. And as we also do that, we also identify the children that cannot read at all, then take them to what we call the reading school. So making those things, if you, if you, if you look at it critically, you now see that it's even cheaper getting a flat screen and having like 100 to 200 children gather in little hubs. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and uh, for all you do with your organization, and we hope uh, the gospel gets spread enough and more people join you in this in this very brief fight you are, you are fighting. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, well, like I always say, you can follow the conversation on social media. Arabi Minds now is the hashtag to use. I'll see you next Sunday. Do have a great week.